research, policy, strategy, and entrepreneurship was technology. In recent months, uh, Mr. Sne has committed considerable efforts towards understanding and advocating for the effective and responsible application of artificial, artificial intelligence in the public sector, is establishing himself as a prominent voice in this vital field. And lastly, his academic endeavors continue with an upcoming program on no-code artificial intelligence um, at MIT. He's a member of a steering committee in the Public Health Extreme Events Research Network and also serves on the Metro Lab General Artificial Intelligence in Local Government Task Force. Mr. Snare, over to you. And uh, we're looking forward to our state of readiness for artificial intelligence in government. Uh, thank you very much. And um, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I'm gonna share some slides. Can everyone see these? Yes. Yes, we're ready. Hi, I'm Justin Snare. In my role with Signal Solutions, I help organizations and government identify, understand, take on, take action towards complex and persistent challenges. I do this through research, policy, product, and technology development. And I'm here to help you understand a bit about artificial intelligence and go over to some, some foundational approaches to consider before adopting AI in government. I have just about 15 minutes, so I'll move quickly through the material. I'll start with the, some background on AI. AI refers to computer systems that can simulate human cognitive abilities like learning, reasoning, and problem solving. And it's also our overarching pursuit to develop machines with human-like or human superior intelligence. AI is trained on specific sets of data to perform tasks. The data comes from many places like public, public data sets, sensors, user interactions, or even experts in specific fields. I like to think of AI as a universe with machine learning as a planet within it. On this machine learning planet, all the cities rely upon each other to some degree. Deep learning is like a capital city, essential to other cities on this planet. Generative AI is the creative district within deep learning city. Gen AI is uh, known for storytelling and creating amazing language, art, music, and for exporting these works to other AI cities. Natural language processing, computer vision are additional major cities, and robotic automation stands as a unique city where several types of AI intersect with mechanical electronic systems to produce movement and interaction in the real world. These AI cities and districts are also increasingly interconnected. Generative AI has a crucial role in enhancing natural language processing models. At the same time, Gen AI requires national, natural language processing based data quality assurance to combat malicious user prompts and reduce con controversial content. Natural language processing has an enormous impact on robotics automation, allowing robots to understand and interact with humans in more naturalistic ways. And computer vision is apt at seeing the world around it as essential for robotic automation systems and needs machine learning to interpret what it sees. AI has evolved through several key eras. Uh, AI 1.0 was largely uh, used rules and probabilities encoded by humans. Uh, it went through a used a series of questions to determining uh, something, for example, whether a picture it was given is a cat or a dog. AI 2.0 uh, began around 2011, uh, deep learning and learned patterns from examples labeled by humans as facts or truths. Uh, an example of this, an AI uh, being asked, is this a cat or a dog? An AI 3.0 is what we're experiencing today. These are foundational models that can do many tasks with simple instructions without requiring to be retrained. An example of AI 3.0 would be explain the difference between a cat and a dog. There are several types of AI, uh, machine learning, deep learning, generative AI, computer vision, natural language processing, and robotic system uh, automation systems. Machine learning provides foundation of many modern AI applications today, from recommendation systems on streaming video platforms to predictive analytics in healthcare. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning used for many applications like mastering games like chess, generating realistic artificial images, to powering voice assistants. Generative uh, AI like ChatGPT 
Computer vision enables machines to see and interpret visual data, such as facial, facial recognition, the uh, technology in some autonomous vehicles, and augmented reality. Na natural language processing focuses on machines understanding and generating human language, such as in chatbots, translation services, and social media sentiment analysis tools. Robotics fuses AI with physical machines from manufacturing robots to personal assistant bots to drones used for mass casualty incident triage. Some applications such as disease surveillance and military use suspend several types of AI. And believe it or not, about 80% of people are actually using AI every day because it's baked into the tools that we use in our lives. But only 37% of people perceive that they're actually using AI. All of these terms are a bit confusing. Uh, so I'm gonna try and help you uh, anchor this and how they relate and differ. Uh, but first we're gonna go into um, uh, AI is poised to join the ranks of something called a general purpose technology. These are innovations that fundamentally reshape entire economies and societies by enabling ways of complementary innovation across industries. Electricity and the internal combustion engine, engines were GPTs that revolutionized manufacturing and transportation in the late 19th century. More recently, another GPT, the internet, birthed countless new businesses and ways of living. Much like electricity and the internal combustion engine and the internet, it's hard to predict exactly how AI will be leveraged and integrated into our society, but it's shaping up to be extremely transformative. Uh, the capabilities of these various types of AI exist on a spectrum from possibilities to precision. It can be incorporated into creative ways to brainstorm what's possible for things like disaster exercises or making sense of stakeholder feedback or strategic planning uh, to considering a variety of potential outcomes. But as we move from along the spectrum from possibilities to process improvements to prediction and finally precision, the decisions become more and more critical and the stakes grow higher. A single type of AI won't win over others. Instead, AI will encompass a multitude, multitude of types and applications that are rapidly make an the indispensable and unavoidable tool for, tool for us to leverage to become more efficient and effective despite the challenges that exist and seem to loom in our future around getting closer to an ideal AI. Uh, I think it's also useful to understand the range of current and theoretical capabilities when talking about AI. Um, AI can be generally categorized into three types, narrow, general, and capable. Narrow, also called weak AI, is focused on specific, well-defined tasks like playing chess or identifying faces. It's what powers applications we engage with today, like Siri and ChatGPT, and even guides Google Maps through traffic. General AI, or strong AI, or AGI, refers to machines with more open-ended intelligence, comparable or superior to humans. Uh, this exists only in theory and science fiction is and it's somewhat far-fetched stuff you see in movies like uh, 2001 a space odyssey a third category capable ai focuses less on replicating human level intelligence and more on enabling ai types and systems to achieve complex real world goals with minimal human oversight or intervention and it adapts as needed the key here is combining narrow capabilities and innovative ways to solve multifaceted problems Imagine leveraging capable AI to coordinate government resources or uh, provide efficient disaster search and rescue or triaging med for medical assistance, assessing infrastructure for repairs and, uh, and maintenance, ensuring effective communication and managing long-term rehabilitation of communities. So, such an AI could predict and help us respond to needs by analyzing data from various resources, issuing early warnings for disasters, or autonomously coordinating resource allocation and government operations. It could continuously learn from events, adapting its strategies for more effective responses in, to future crises, and it could, take, could someday take actions in the real world. AI could streamline government workflows by automating routine tasks, reducing the time and resources required for data processing and analysis. AI could enable tailored strategies in government areas like such as public health and crisis management, analyzing individual or group data, leading to more effective and personalized solutions for your constituents. AI could optimize financial and human resource allocation by predicting needs and outcomes, ensuring the best use of limited available resources. 
<clears throat> AI could reduce human error in data and handling, leading to more accurate outcomes. Automation of repetitive tasks by AI can free up time for humans to engage in more creative and complex problem-solving activities, types of activities that computers and AI may never be good at. AI can aid in analyzing vast amounts of data, providing insights that lead to better informed decisions and facilitating distributed decision-making across organizations. AI can also aid in analyzing, uh, I'm sorry, I have a typo. I'm going to move on. Um, AI can, can, does have some challenges. Uh, AI can unintentionally increase disparities, especially in rural and underprivileged areas due to biases in data or un unequal access to AI technologies. Many AI models are also what's referred to as uh, black boxes. They're unexplainable uh, to some degree, making it difficult for users to understand how conclusions are drawn, which can reduce trust in these systems. And AI needs data, acquiring and integrating data across different jurisdictions and across the public and private systems poses a challenge and could uh, severely hinder AI's effectiveness for government purposes. Some additional challenges, um, outdated layers of uh, legacy government infrastructure and software limit AI's integration, adoption, and potential. Traditional government training often doesn't include artificial intelligence, limiting the ability of, uh, of government to develop, evaluate, or implement AI solutions. AI raises ethical questions around fairness, accountability, and societal impacts, which need to be carefully considered, particularly in government uses. And the use of AI in government, particularly with, with, in healthcare and public health data, raises concerns about individual privacy, data security, and the risk of re-identification and anonymized data sets. I'm gonna get into responsible AI in government. Um, AI should not be viewed as an easy button to decomplexify government processes. It should be seen as part of a much larger puzzle in the strategic and responsible application of technologies, each complementing the other to form a robust, comprehensive solution for government challenges. Applying AI to otherwise poor performing government processes will likely just speed up or scale those problems. Though adopting AI can be an opportunity to evaluate possibly inefficient or poor performing human -centric, centric processes. Developing and deploying AI responsibly can be complicated, but it's critical to consider AI from a socio-technical perspective. It is not just a technology problem. It is not just a, a installing software. And I have some questions you can ask yourself to help you consider those socio-technical perspectives. It can start by asking these questions. Do those in your organization have a fundamental understanding of how AI works, including its training, limitations, and potential risks? Have you engaged with a gr diverse group of stakeholders beyond IT within your organization to consider the pros and cons of AI use? Have you identified and prioritized management tasks and organizational processes that AI could enhance? Do the identified AI uses align with organizational governance structures, standards, organization, and community values and risk frameworks? How does AI integrate with those existing initiatives, such as data modernization and infrastructure improvement efforts within and outside your organization? Are data protection and privacy policies in place, especially for sensitive uses? Can you audit the tool's outputs for biases and risks? And are you prepared to take responsibility for those outputs? Does your organization have in-house skills and have you allocated resources for AI initiatives and ongoing costs? Are training resources available and are employees adequately prepared to use AI tools effectively? And is there organizational transparency and trust concerning the AI's processes and outputs both internally and with, within the community? And lastly, does the AI tool integrate seamlessly with existing workflows and systems? How would existing workflows and systems need to be altered to make this possible? And are contingency plans and support channels in place for AI crises, including downtime and other failures? AI readiness means continuous learning, adapting best practices and addressing risks openly. But blind faith in technology is always unwise. And so AI is no different. Responsible adoption means verifying AI's impacts, having backup plans, frequently reevaluating its usefulness based on clear criteria. This is not a one-time change, but an ongoing balancing act. 
And as AI evolves, so must its governance and consideration of evolving risks that it poses. And the key, uh, the keys are ethical intent, pragmatic caution, and sustained uh, watchfulness. And thank you for your time. Uh, I want to thank the National School of Government for hosting this. And please um, reach out if you have any questions about assessment, strategy, policy, training, uh, I, AI, tech ideation, or development uh, needs. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sne, and thank you for an insightful uh, conversation. Uh, you are introducing us to a new language, uh, uh, making sure that we are, we are prompted to think about the concerns that artificial intelligence brings, both as benefits, uh, pros and cons. Um, colleagues, uh, there is a question in the chat box. Uh, it deals with regulating artificial intelligence. And the second question is, is there any artificial intelligence that the South African government employees can use to experiment with how artificial intelligence can assist in their work? So these two questions are in the chat box. Uh, we will have a response from our delegation uh, from the Department of Communication and Digital Technologies. Let me call closer to the mic. Uh, Dr. Biali, are you there? Let me thank you, Mr. Sne. Uh, if you don't mind, just to switch off your camera. Um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Piale Mandau. Uh, she's a global strategic communications expert with over 17 years of experience in the field. She's a former director uh, in a consulting department and with over 11 years of experience working as a journalist with reputable organizations such as Press Trust of India and Business Standard, and with more than seven years of experience advising corporates. He's an award-winning investigative journalist, and Ms. Mandal has an extensive background in the communication industry. Ms. Mandal, over to you. Looking forward to your input on how can government communicators leverage artificial intelligence for communication and media relations. Over to you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Louise, for the introduction. And again, I'll just point out one uh, fallacy of artificial intelligence or generative AI. I am not a doctor yet, uh, but if you ask generative AI to give a brief profile about me, it starts with uh, Dr. Riali, and it also talks about that I won a Pulitzer Award. So, which is something I'll come to. <laughs> yes, so this is something I'll cover in my session, which is called data hallucination, and that is what AI is also known for. So, good morning, everyone, distinguished guests, members of NSG, GCIS, all my fellow speakers, and all the attendees. I'm so glad that I'll be talking about this very important and pertinent topic today because if you look at whole of last year uh, AI and discussion around AI have been taken a center stage be it the COP28 in Dubai or recently concluded Davos talks and uh, thank you so much Justin for setting the stage it was brave of you to try to really um, describe a topic that is that huge in just 15 minutes and you have done a great job at that so today I'm going to talk specifically about what role AI can play in communication and how you can leverage some of the tools which are already there. I saw one of the questions in chat that um, what are the tools we can use immediately and play around with to see how we can uh, leverage AI in our day job. So I will cover that aspect of AI and you will hear me talk a lot about generative AI so generative AI, as Justin explained, it's just a subset of AI, which helps create new data and content rather than just processing existing data and content. And how it does that is by learning from a larger set of data and it picks up patterns and characteristics and style from that data and use that knowledge to recreate new data, new content, which are similar in style to the existing data. So before I uh, uh, go into the details, 
I would like to just do a very small poll and uh, ask all the participants, uh, is any one of you using generative AI in any form in your day-to-day -day job? Uh, Chat GPT is one that all of you must have heard of. There is BART, there are other uh, free-to-use generative AI tool. So is anyone using it? You can just put yes or no in the chat. That would be really helpful and help me get a sense. So, so what I see when most of the time I ask this question is most people have some sense of generative AI or they have already dabbled with generative AI. And when I ask government officials and uh, communicators across the world that what are you using generative AI for, inevitably I get three most common tasks that they are using it for. The first, of course, is text generation. Like I use it for writing my mails, for writing documents, for writing social media content. The second response I get is I use generative AI to help me distill down a document. If there is a five-page document, I tell AI to condense it into one paragraph. Or if I have taken notes and minutes of the meeting, I ask AI to condense it to the key takeaways from the meeting. The third thing that people use mostly is for research. Like when you ask Google to give you information about, say, a recent land reform bill in your constituency, the chances are Google will throw up five news articles. But when you ask the same question to any of this generative AI, they'll give you a synopsis of the current bill that is there. So generative AI is for mostly generating and creating larger volumes of content. And if you're using generative AI for any of this following that I have mentioned, that's great. You're doing good. But if you're using it, only for this, then you are missing out on leveraging the full potential of AI. One aspect of the AI is the generative power. There is also another aspect where AI can actually analyze large volumes of historic data, pick up patterns and trends from the past, and can predict the future trends. That's what we call the predictive analytics. And when you bring together the generative capability of AI and match it with the predictive analytics, that's when you get a really powerful tool that can help you elevate your communication. And what are the things that then this powerful tool can do for you? Improve your productivity, help in making better strategic decisions, help in establishing better engagement and connect with your audience and improve the reach of your content. Like as communicators in public offices, one of the things that we look at is how fast can we really churn out communication materials, be it issuing a press release, be it writing website articles. So generative AI tools which are readily available now, be it chat GPT or BART, can help you cut down the time in generating text and content. But the key thing here is use it as your first draft and not the ultimate uh, product that goes out to your audience. It can not only create press releases for you, but it can also convert the same press release into blog posts into website articles, into multiple contents, which you can use later on, saving you time and really enhancing the quality of paperwork in local government. It can create formal meeting notes, like the meeting that is happening now, there are AI tools and plugins which help you take notes automatically. All you have to do for leveraging this capability of AI is to give well-crafted instruction to the AI, something that we call the prompt, which clearly defines what you want the AI to do. Now, the second thing that you can do in terms of improving your productivity is automate repetitive tasks 
that your day job requires you to do. For instance, if your day job requires you to answer questions about certain press release that you have issued or certain uh, draft policy that you have issued, AI chatbot can actually help answer some of the basic questions around that policy. Already corporates across the world are using AI chatbots uh, to provide FAQs to their audience and even governments are dabbling with AI chatbots where some of the repetitive tasks can be taken over by the AI. Now also, you know, AI chatbots, how it differs from the previous generation of chatbots that were there is that AI chatbots make the conversation sound more human. So it's as if like you're interacting with a person who is sitting next to you, then interacting with a robot. So it, it really acts as a powerful two-way communication tool. But the only caveat here is, again, that you have to train your chatbot so that it knows from where to pull out critical information from your website or other documents. Recently, there has been instances when company chatbots have gone rogue and they have started giving misinformation about the company. So that's another fallout that is there in AI. The third thing that it can do is it can actually help you break down complex policy documents. All of us know how complex tax rules or amendment to certain policies can be. The language is still very bureaucratic and the audience it's meant for, like the grassroots audience, they very rarely could understand that what the law means for them. So what AI can do for you is break down those complex documents into simple language. At times when I find it difficult in understanding certain documents, I go to AI and ask that, can you please explain it for a fifth grader? And it gives me uh, that document in a nutshell and it writes it, rewrites it in very simplistic language. So that's another thing that AI can do to improve your productivity. Training and onboarding new recruits is something that I'm also experimenting with, with the local government, where the local government is trying to train the young recruits on AI tools. So what happens is, suppose you have implemented a new policy within your organization, can you train your new recruits so that they know the procedure, they know the protocol? Suppose you have adopted a new AI policy. You can train, you can create scenarios for your young recruits wherein they can, you can ask them that, okay, this is a document, are you going to put it up on the new policy? And if they say yes, the AI chatbot would show certain options that no, this is a sensitive document, you cannot put it up there. Or the AI chatbot can say that yes, this is the right decision you took. So training and onboarding is another area. As we're talking about improved decision making. So when I say improved decision making, uh, as communicators, we always are looking at building very engaging narratives. And more often than not, we really don't have data to back up our narrative, like why I'm using certain tone in my messaging, except for saying that it's my gut feeling or this is how it has been done. Now, AI and the predictive tools can really empower you with data to back what you are writing. So you can use the predictive tools to see what people are talking about on social media, how your audience is responding to certain issues. And it's very critical in an election year when you want to connect with your audience and have your finger at the pulse of the uh, nation. So like in India, what we do is when we issue new policy, we put it up on the website for a public consultation. And very rarely we get limited number of structured response from the audience, but much of the discussion around that policy happens on social media, happens on Twitter, happens on LinkedIn. So how do you capture that? So AI tools can help you 
capture those conversations, important conversations that are happening on social media and help you make much more informed decision, help you craft more strategic communication plan for your targeted towards your audience. The third thing is better accessibility and increasing the reach of your content. So AI tools can help you convert. There are existing AI tools that help convert speech uh, text to speech, speech to text. So someone with um, a visual impairment, they can uh, readily use the voice tool to convert the text into audio and can listen to it. Similarly, uh, like India, South Africa is also a multicultural, multilinguistic nation, nation where there are diverse communities. So you can use AI tools to translate your existing content or press release for various communities in multiple languages. And uh, you might say that Google Translation was already there for doing that, but trust me, AI understands the nuances of language better than translation tools that are existing out there. And uh, mostly because like in uh, India and in South Africa also, we use a lot of idiomatic phrases like the sun will rise and like that our government will rise. So it's very difficult for translation tool to literally translate that. And uh, AI tools really get that idiomatic phrases and it can do a better job in translating the content into multiple languages. Having said that, all things sounds very um, good to be true. And it sounds that AI can really solve a lot of our communication issues. Uh, indeed it can, but it comes with its own set of challenges. One of the biggest challenge is that, that AI is fast, it's fluent, but it's not factual. Like at the beginning, I mentioned that if you ask AI to write my profile, it puts up all the wrong information. So this is something called data hallucination. So AI puts up information which are not really there. If you ask what is the market of AI in South Africa, AI will give you some inputs like it is in trillion dollars and BCG said that, KPMG said that. But when you go to Google and look up for those reports, you won't find any because AI just created those data for you. It just manufactured those data for you. So for government communicators, that becomes a big challenge. Second is privacy concerns, which Justin touched upon. Uh, you know, if you are in public office, you are dealing with sensitive information. And if you are using any free to use AI tool, then chances are you are exposing your sensitive data to a third party. So what happens is if you're using any of the free tools, whatever content you are putting up there actually belongs to the company who has created that tool. Now you can turn off uh, the data sharing at best but that's again a gray area. So the best, your best bet would be to use some paid version of the content. Again, like Justin mentioned, do your due diligence, uh, identify who all are the trusted third party vendor, whose softwares and products you can use. And whatever you do, even if you have a trusted vendor, never put identifiable personal data, no social security numbers, no phone numbers, no emails that can be traced back to any individual. The third thing about AI is that it's as flawed as human beings. So as human beings, we have not uh, always been very great. Some of the contents that are already existing in past are racist, are uh, misogynist, are sexist, and AI is con continuously learning from those set of data. So at best, AI will also have those similar bias and it will reflect in the output it's giving you. If you're asking AI to write certain content, chances are it would be biased towards certain community. That's why it's important to have a human in the loop who can constantly monitor the output from the AI. And also uh, very relevant to 
nations like India and South Africa, we have communities which are at the grassroots. Uh, I have been working with a government initiative in a tribal district in India, and we realized that AI couldn't give relevant information about them because they are missing in the data, because there is no data around those tribal indigenous communities. So that's another fallout of uh, AI. Again, it lacks the nuance of human understanding. It lacks empathy. It lacks the human emotion to understand uh, if you have implemented a policy for certain target groups, why you have done that. But having said that, AI does open up a lot of new opportunities. And as someone in the question mentioned that uh, the opportunities really outweigh the risk. There will be newer risks because the technology in itself is evolving. So you have to face new risks, new challenges. What is our way forward? So what we can do as communicators at the best is AI literacy, keeping ourselves updated with the new technologies about what is happening around the world, uh, understanding the do's and don'ts around the technology, having our individual guardrails up, knowing that what we can share with the AI and what we can't share. At the institutional level, government agencies should at best uh, really frame their policies and regulation if it's not there already. And lastly, have continuous training to reinforce what you are learning. Having said that, I will end my uh, topic by saying as a communicator with over uh, 18 years of experience, for me, a good piece of communication is something that is that has credibility, that has creativity, that has clarity and connection. Now, when you talk about AI, AI has already overtaken us in clarity. AI hardly makes any syntax errors or typos. Credibility is not there yet. But the kind of advancement being made each and every day, it will reach there sometime. Creativity, AI is already creating music, creating artworks, which is winning awards. So that lets us with connection. As humans, that's a superpower that we have. Imagine if this whole session was being delivered by my AI avatar, you wouldn't even connect with me. My message wouldn't land with you and it wouldn't resonate with you. So we still have that superpower that AI doesn't have. So leverage AI to increase your productivity, but at the same time as communicators, don't lose the human aspect to connect with your audience. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Piali Mandal. Uh, what a lovely presentation on the tools, techniques, and how we can leverage artificial intelligence for communication and media relations. Uh, thank you for an awesome input. And also, please just check the QA box. There's a number of questions in the engagement. Let me uh, invite Siddhartha Dubi to stand closer, sir, uh, as a professor, a distinguished journalist, professional professor with a wealth of experience gained in global television newsrooms. Currently he holds the position of journalism instructor at Medill Northwestern University, is a certified media and communications trainer accredited by the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Duby uh, also brings over two decades of experience as a former television journalist with a diverse and enriching career that has taken him to newsrooms in New York, Singapore, London, and Mumbai. His contributions have been witnessed across the prominent media outlets, such as the Dow Jones TV, CNBC, Asia, Reuters TV, and the Economic Times Television. Prof, uh, what new skills do government officials and communicators need in an AI-driven world to stay relevant. Over to you, Prof. If you mind. Thank you so much. Go on. Thank you so much um, for that very kind 
Ah, my camera's on now. Thank you so much for that very kind uh, introduction. And uh, good morning, everybody. I'm speaking to you from a small town called Evanston, just outside, outside of Chicago in the United States. And it's almost 4 a.m. right here. And it's quite cold outside. Um, it's daunting. It's really confusing. And for many of us uh, who have spent decades in government service or in a company, is actually quite terrifying. Cloud computing, big data, open source software, improved algorithms, really, it doesn't really make much sense to our day-to-day -day jobs. But as Justin Snare said a short while ago, 80% of us around the world are already using AI, while 30% of us thereabouts uh, acknowledge that or know about it, which I thought was a fascinating um, uh, sort of fact there and he's absolutely right i mean ai is all around us right from advertising to uh, marketing to in your gym coming up with a workout program which they say is better for you um and through government service which is what all of you are in um the question is is how do you make ai work for you as opposed to the other way around you working for ai because really at least in the United States, it seems that we are all working for AI, uh, which is wrong. It's the other way around, but that's just the messaging, which is coming out from um, especially people who want to market their services with, with AI. The first thing perhaps you should do, which you haven't already, is hire a 20 or 30 year old someone in your office, hire many of them. It's not a joke, it's important to do so, reason being, these young people are evolving with an industry which is evolving itself. Um, I'm 55 years old. I rely on my students uh, all around the world to tell me about what's going on in terms of technology trends, in terms of how music is being synthesized, where they're getting their information from, what are the trends they are looking out for, what are the trends I have no idea uh, that, uh, that exist or are coming up. So having a young workforce is extremely important, I think. Uh, I have a friend who's a senior executive at General Electric Healthcare, and the way he describes AI is putting all sorts of data, variables, information into the system, and then it comes out with solutions, which then he and his team um, choose from. It's impossible to do that on a human, on, for human beings to do that on such a massive scale. Uh, GE, like many other massive firms, work all around the world, all around the United States, providing hospitals and healthcare centers with multi-million dollar machines. It is very, very difficult to predict uh, how long that machine takes. Uh, it takes from a factory in Wisconsin to a port in Shanghai. Um, AI, uh, or learning about AI is incredibly important to big companies and to governments. Uh, companies here in the, United Spain, in the United States spend hundreds of millions of dollars in training their staff on how to use AI. And that's the point I really want to make here is in training. And uh, uh, what seems to be the most effective way in training is having a mentorship program in your office or in your ministry uh, at all levels. Identify people or pick people who are familiar with AI and have them train in batches according to seniority and especially according to specific job roles. Have them train and the trainers become the trainers and it goes on from there. Don't train everyone at one shot. Uh, there have been a lot of studies, in fact, Boston Consultancy Group came out with a recent study where they asked, um, where they surveyed people and asked them how they liked their training being done. Most of them, most of them said that they did not like mass uh, venues, huge sessions with thousands of people being lectured upon by a professor or several people with a microphone and uh, uh, Excel sheets on a massive board where they learn from. They want smaller sessions, which are more individualized to their specific job roles. And they also said, according to this Boston Consultancy study, that they want to learn on the job. 
So in your ministry, in your department, if you are able to in institute a system where you can learn on the job and how to do your role or how to input data into a program, that seems to be uh, the, preferred, the preferred way in learning about this. Um, so for instance, I wanted to give you an example. So say your minister or your ministry is embarking on a large, expensive, and politically sensitive and important project, um, healthcare. Um, Justin mentioned health is a huge um, uh, area where AI is incredibly important. And make it granular, make it healthcare, make it women, and make it in rural areas. Now, Piali kept on mentioning that South Africa and India are very similar in terms of uh, demographics. People who live in crowded urban areas, while the majority of the population lives in uh, rural areas in both countries. So make it women, make it a certain age group um, in rural areas. Use information which is old, which is new, and which is predictive. Um, as Piali rightfully said, one of the most important things of artificial intelligence is that it could predict trends. So if you're able to predict healthcare patterns, healthcare needs of women in rural areas with their age demographics, targeting certain issues, whether it's cancer, whether it's malnutrition, access to clean water, childcare, whatever it is, it could be incredibly important for your ministry for an outlay of a health project, uh, you know, in the years, in the months to come. Um, Piali also talked about communicating. Uh, for those of you who are communications professionals, uh, people who deal with the media, um, the easiest way to get across a, an announcement is a blast on Twitter, which has its usefulness, which is becoming less useful day by day on Twitter, which I guess now is known as X. Um, what if you were able to, con to narrow down your focus uh, and again, we can take the um, we can take the uh, women in rural areas healthcare initiative. If you wanted to focus your message on people who really would do something with that announcement, people who would write about it, uh, which means media, people who would perhaps collaborate with your ministry, which means investors, whether they're in South Africa, whether they're outside South Africa whether they're other governments, whether they're NGOs, whether they're lobbyists, it's a whole buffet of people out there. Uh, you could get all that information or get a lot of that information through uh, artificial intelligence tools, mapping out who needs that information, um, getting press, which really does help your mission, help your ministry, help your minister, help your government, and help you, you uh, your role as disseminating that information, not quantity, but quality. Uh, and that's where I think um, AI really, really does play a massive role, again, which is very, very difficult, almost impossible for human beings to do on such a massive scale. Um, one of the pioneers of deploying AI in the way they work in the United States and, and around the world is Amazon. Uh, right from the get-go, Amazon has existed in targeting products to people. And if you think about it, that's what government is. Government is a service-oriented industry, like Amazon. Government has many products, whether it's healthcare, whether it's defense, whether it's um, governance, elections, um, roads, an array of products. They need to target those products to areas in the country, to voters in the country who need those products, like Amazon, whether it's books, whether it's food, whether it's toys, uh, clothes, what have you. But the only difference, or one of the differences between Amazon and a government is that Amazon is very quick and very effective on adapting to new technology, where governments around the world, including the United States government, which is the richest in the world, 
slow on adapting new technology. It's getting faster, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. Um, like a company, like Amazon or General Electric, a government is consumer facing. So think about that. You are the consumer facing industry. Therefore, the consumer needs to know exactly what's going on uh, with your plans going ahead. Uh, and really, uh, Piali and uh, Justin said a lot of what I was going to say, but invest in invest in who you hire in your ministry, mentor them, get yourself mentorships. And one of the most successful uh, ways of going about this I see in the United States and in many other countries in the world is associating yourself with the university. Because after all, a lot of the research and a lot of the breakthroughs coming around artificial intelligence is not just with the private sector, the Sam Altmans of the world, it is with universities around the world, not just the United States, not just Silicon Valley, universities all around the world. Get yourself, get your ministry, get your employees associated with the university. And that I think would be very, very beneficial. Thank you all very much for your time. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, and thank you for the insights of connecting artificial intelligence across all the sectors. Uh, our, our key group today is around communicators, but all communicators uh, are functioning in different uh, key sectors. So thank you very much for the input. And uh, I'm loving the idea that we are pointing youth, uh, especially the digital, the digital natives, who understand uh, the space in, in all its glory. Thank you very much, Prof. And um, please assist with the questions uh, in the QA. I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, Mr. Philippe Borman uh, to come closer. Let me introduce you to him. Uh, Philippe Borman is an authority in risk and uh, crisis communication with over two decades of experience. He serves as volunteer vice president of the International Association of Risk and Crisis Communication. Philippe has collaborated with global organizations such as the World Health Organization, European Union and West Africa Union on strategic communication projects. As an educator and speaker, he is a regular lecturer at universities and business schools across Europe and North Africa. He's frequently invited to speak at conferences on topics ranging from crisis communication to the role of technology in public relations. Can I please uh, welcome you, sir? And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing some more about how can uh, artificial intelligence help government crisis preparedness and communication. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for having me. Um, Yes, we'll, we'll focus on AI in specifically in the context of uh, crisis communications, and I'll, I'll just show a couple of slides. But before I do that, um, I would like to position this uh, short talk uh, around crisis communications. For those who have experience, it's not new. Uh, but for those who maybe have not faced crises in the context of communication, then um, uh, what I'm going to show you uh, is, is all around the use of AI in this specific context. And to introduce that, I would like you to simply reflect on that one single resource that us who are specialized in crisis risk or emergency communication never have enough of. And it is one of those resources that not only in crisis comes, but in real life as well, uh, we cannot create, we cannot make that resource. And that is the crucial uh, resource of time. As you would understand, uh, during a crisis, an emergency or a risk, time is of the essence. And that is said quite often. But in reality, uh, in certain contexts, specifically when we talk about emergencies, natural disasters, pandemics, epidemics, that time is saving lives or not saving lives. Um, so I want to move a little bit away from the reputational aspect of crisis comms, which you often hear about in the private sector, 
this is a government communicators um, gathering and the government any government has this responsibility of risk communication before something happens crisis communication in the middle of a of a situation and emergency communication throughout the cycle as we say and that time aspect that is exactly where ai can play a huge role can make us save time can make us communicate quicker faster more specifically to segmented audiences and things like that and so i'm in the context of what i'm going to show in a couple of slides quickly keep that in mind while i go through the slides now let me see if technology is actually uh, working uh, this should show my canva environment and this should show the slide so if you can just confirm to me if you're seeing now in full screen my slide can someone just say me if that's working or not? Not yet. It is? Okay. No, no, no. We don't have it on the side. Sorry, I, I didn't quite catch that. Are you seeing my slides or not? Can you try again? Okay. Is that uh, working? It's coming. Yes, perfect. Thank okay, you very perfect. much. Technology is with us. Okay, so my, my quick talk here is about the impact of AI on, on crisis comms. And um, maybe this has been said before, but I'll, I'll reset again and again. AI is not going to replace us, but someone who understands AI uh, will maybe replace you. Um, I've, I just caught the last part of the last talk. Uh, sorry about that. Working in emergencies, last minute meetings pop up. Sorry about that. Uh, and where uh, Gen I was mentioned. AI through maybe Gen I can be a bit more savvy about using latest technology, but we're talking about using AI through the communication cycle. And I'm talking specifically about crisis comms. Crisis comms is not something that you give to Gen I people. You give that to people with maybe 10, 15, 20 years experience. So independently of your age bracket, AI will have an impact on your job anyway. So um, let me go into AI and maybe also go back because AI is not something new. Um, AI is there since the 50s. In 56, you know, Rand Corporation did a, a big project. In uh, 97, we had IBM's Deep Blue. And in 17, Google AI again defeated a Go champion. And you could think, oh, but defeating a chess champion or something like that. Yeah, well, that's fun to have, fun to know, but the implications of that were, were enormous. These were big shifts in uh, human and machine interaction and also in AI. So again, AI is not new. The only thing that changed now uh, recently or maybe a bit of a year ago is that we can interact through a web browser. Anyone with an internet connection can interact with AI. That's the new thing. But otherwise, the technology which is behind that, the, the how it evolves, is not new the industry understands that and of course now that it's out in the open a lot of these questions pop up about ethics and i'll come back to that again but just to position here ai is not a new technology it's been around for a long time ai in uh, crisis comms crisis comms is a very specific specialized field of public relations or, or let's say corporate communication or government communication uh, I wrote a, a small book and, and just uh, two days ago, I was like, oh my God, this little book or this little guide is now already a year old. So this was written in February or published in February uh, last year. And uh, yeah, so next month it will be a year old. So it's time to write a new chapter because these things evolve like every single month uh, and it's difficult to keep up. But the examples I'll be giving here are some of them come from the practical guide I wrote a year ago and other ones are just uh, new applications. Now, let us see in uh, crisis comms. So one of the things that you want to do or that you should do uh, is crisis response planning. Normally, every government has a uh, risk, um, um, let's say a risk view of what potential risks could be in the next three months, six months, up to a year. And from there, we distill crisis uh, response um, planning uh, a crisis response plan and i'm focusing here on the communication aspect of that right it's not about crisis management it's about crisis communications 
how could AI help in that? Well, one of the examples in my book here is you give AI, your AI system, whichever the system is that you use, uh, you give it a background and context. In, in this case, it's a cyber attack on a, on a fictive corporation. But when you give that background from there, all your interactions with the AI system that you're using will be in context. And that will help enormously with all the questioning that you do and all the planning that you can do with the assistance of AI. Now, one of the things that happens when you ask an AI system trained or not trained. Now, of course, uh, we're talking about government communication here. Um, again, uh, the examples are with chat GPT. What I would assume is that the government entities using AI have their own open source AI system or maybe direct access to APIs from commercial systems, but use it behind their own firewalls on their own servers and trained on their own content. Of course, what I'm showing you is public information. But of course, if you want to use this uh, in a serious way, you would train the system yourself and maybe combine it with uh, more open systems as well. Coming back to that planning, what I liked enormously and uh, which I found really interesting to see when I asked that question is that internal communication is in there. And you would be amazed, and trust me when I'm saying this, you would be amazed how many crisis communication plans are 100% focused on the external communication side of things. While when you think about it, in a crisis situation or in an emergency situation, your first communication is an internal one. Here in this case, ChatGPT understood that. So it researched probably the best uh, resources that there are out there on crisis comms. And internal comms is point number two, which to me is telling me that the system, at least with the results it gives me, is uh, already better than maybe 80% of the crisis plans I see out there. So very interesting to do your planning. It is an overview, but we need to go back to the basics and internal comms needs to be in there and AI in this case provided that. Audience segmentation is another uh, hot topic, and I think it's a crucial topic. Having worked in uh, global emergencies on the ground uh, throughout Africa, for instance, and those were health emergencies, think about Ebola and COVID and other situations, uh, earthquakes, audience segmentation is crucial. That's where you start saving lives if in your planning you do a correct audience segmentation. You know, it, the teams I work with for the moment, which is a, a large UN agency specialized in, in emergencies, every single time someone in the team said that we need to communicate with the general public, those people get a slap on the hand. And it should be like that. I mean, in the private sector, I would say people should get fired when they use the general public concept. There is no general public. We need to communicate with segmented audiences. And again, here, I did a quick exercise before this um this uh, session uh, here i'm using uh, another ai system perplexity and what i'm getting when i'm asking here the question was about segmenting audiences in the context of um uh, fire forest fire around cape town what you're getting and this is open ai right uh, what i'm getting now is a audio segmentation in a pretty good detail is this replacing my real audience segmentation that I would do when I'm sitting in Cape Town and when I'm the emergency manager for the city? Of course not. But me, as a European sitting in Portugal, not knowing anything about Cape Town, apart from my general knowledge, I have discovered a lot of great insights immediately in a couple of seconds, which would allow me, if I'm flown in to help with a forest fire in Cape Town, to already understand what some pieces of the demographic situations are the cultural situations uh, which will of course influence my uh, target audiences uh, and which will influence my audience segmentation in my crisis communication plan or emergency plan this in just a couple of seconds again um, ai is used a lot in content creation and that's all very nice when it's about creative content uh, generation but when we are talking about crisis comms, it's about much more than just fancy phrases. It's about transparency, about caring, empathy, all these things that ultimately serve to increase the trust in the company or in the government entity reacting and communicating around an emergency. 
Again, this is an example where quickly in a couple of seconds, AI generated text that I could use. Would you copy paste this and use it like that? Of course not. We are serious communicators. We would look at it, adapt it again. But when I started this talk, I was talking about time. I prefer to start with this than to start with a blank page because it saves me time again. And this, I must say, if you have just a couple of seconds to read this, is again in 50% of the cases better than, I've, than what I've seen out there written by humans. So again, time saving, but also AI understanding empathy. I hear a lot of copywriters say that AI will never be able to write like a human. I leave it out there, but I've seen texts, I've seen speeches, I've seen reactive statements, which are much more human than any human has written or that I've seen. And much more importantly, we see now studies coming out where humans cannot make the difference between AI generated texts or written by a top copywriter. So that tells me that AI has a crucial role to play there. And again, if you train the system on your tone of voice, on empathy, then it will give you text back, which is empathic, which will use the correct words in a crisis or emergency situation. Key messages are crucial in our uh, job. Again, an example, um, it picks out the very important things, safety, security, immediate action, priority, staying informed, internal hotlines, which even looks at how you could organize your internal uh, communication. But this was, again, based on a, on a detailed briefing of this cybersecurity incident. The commitment to open communication is in there. So it takes all these very important concepts and framings that we use in crisis communications. The AI understands that. Another thing which is interesting is because, again, now we're focusing on the external part, media relations, Q&As and red teaming. For those who don't know, red teaming comes from the, the military. Uh, red teaming is playing the adversary role against your own team to see where your plan uh, has maybe some gaps. So it's really playing the, uh, the devil's advocate and uh, going through a plan or in the context of media relations, playing the very difficult journalist. A journalist is never difficult. It's just someone doing uh, his or her job. Again, here, uh, I've asked the AI to generate questions so I can prepare my executive to go out there and stand in front of the cameras. Um, this is simple. This is asking the AI, take on the role as a journalist. You can even specify the kind of media that the AI should represent. It will go through other interviews. It will look at how that uh, journalist or how that medium is tending to, uh, to be biased or not biased. And then you can use these questions in a Q&A session to prepare your official to go in front of the cameras. That is preparation work, but it can go even further. Today, platforms integrate AI. This is a platform, Udly, uh, which is started out as being used to, uh, let's say, train and prepare people, self-assess people on speaking in public. Now, this is uh, Ford's uh, CEO who has used the platform to prepare for a media interview. What the AI does, it helps you to check on your filler words, which are, you know, trying to avoid them. It uh, looks at your key messages. It looks at the rhythm of how you talk. I know I talk too fast most of the time. Um, it looks at these things. It gives you report back so you can optimize your speech delivery, your interviews with the media. And this is just an example of AI being integrated into a software uh, service online. Another one is operation efficiency. Um, it's very structured. AI can look at um, SOPs. Uh, it can look at how your organization is set up and then look at improvements. In this case, um, I asked it to act as a crisis communicator and looking at, again, in context, how my procedure could look like. And then you get a nicely tabulated overview on, you know, format of output, who is responsible, the procedure, and you can question that and optimize it. Again, would you copy paste this and put it into your SOP? Of course not. It's again about saving time in the preparation phase, in this case, on how you could optimize your crisis communication team, how you looked at 
what the communication channels would be, uh, what the sign-off procedures would be, how you can optimize those, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not only about creating content and communication, it's also about operations. You can use AI to optimize your crisis communication operational setup. Challenges, there are challenges uh, for uh, AI. We all know that the public systems uh, are data biased uh, or based on a data bias. But again, I would like to um, counter that with the fact that uh, human beings are not much better. Uh, all of us here uh, in this webinar, when it comes down to communication, just the aspect of communication, we have more than 42 different biases that we use all the time, independent of your cultural background, independent of where you live, on your education level, whatever, we're all wired like that in our brains. Uh, so let's first of all look at our own biases and then let's look at the bias AI could have and then look at optimizing this because again if you take ai seriously you would train it and you would check those biases before you start using it internally and that is uh, comes all down to the dependency on pre-training which is a crucial aspect uh, organizations should understand first of all which the best ai models are out there how can they be trained on what they should be trained how the biases could be minimized as much as possible and then of course looking at data security then the ethical question, can we use AI? I think we can, it's a technology. We've always used technology. The problem with technology is how to use it. Can you, are you going to use it for good or for bad? We already seen examples of AI being used for bad. I have a full list of case studies of AI being used for good. Um, should we communicate about the fact that AI is being used for our communications? Yes. The, any kind of international public relations or communication organization has now ethical codes in place. And I do think that as a government, you should be very clear, very forward and transparent about the fact when AI is used in generating content and in communications and when it is not. I've just seen a latest study where an audience was served AI generated content, AI assisted content and human content. There was no difference in the perception and the acceptance of that communication of those messages with that audience. So most people will not see if something is has been generated by AI. But I do think we have an ethical um, we have an ethical topic here, and that any kind of government who uses AI or any organization, in fact, should be very transparent about the use of AI to generate communication uh, material or not. Then, just to close the future, uh, it's always very difficult <laughs> to foresee the future. But what I would think that will happen is that we'll see an, a vertical integration of AI in different applications, meaning we'll see AI being used vertically in the transport industry, uh, AI specifically being used for um, computing uh, systems, AI being used specifically for media relations, but also AI specifically used for crisis comms. So I think a lot of organizations today are looking at a very specific field of what we do uh, and will integrate from A to Z AI in the different workflows that we have. So AI for government is definitely coming. Uh, and then within there, the different applications. So a more vertical approach instead of a general public, publicly available uh, approach is something that I, I do see coming. Um, uh, personally, I, we're working and, and with other colleagues and all, with Justin as well, uh, working at looking really at deep integration of AI in uh, crisis and emergency communication. And I think that is definitely the future that we have. Um, at the end of the day, um, I would like to end with this. This is a picture I took when I was on a mission in uh, Sierra Leona during a, an emergency. And uh, however we go about crisis communications, use of technology, AI or whatever, I think the fundamental thing that we need to remember is that it's, it's not what you want to tell your audience. This is what they can hear. And anything that helps me from a technology po point of view or AI save time and optimize that communication in the context of an emergency and by definition then as well as a result saves lives is good goes it as long as it's ethically used and it's transparently used and it increases trust 
um, I think AI is a bright future in uh, communications and crisis comms. Thank you. Very happy to uh, ask your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe Orman, for uh, a very insightful presentation. And thank you for connecting to some of the crises in South Africa that we've experienced, some of the disasters that we've needed to, to uh, communicate over. Thank you very much for the engagement. Please just check in the in the QA box. There are a number of questions that are, are raised. Uh, in particular, some of the questions on the ethical dilemmas. Let me um, call Prof. Charu Malorta uh, closer. Uh, let me introduce Prof. Malorta to you. Uh, she's an eminent professor, authority in the domains of e-governance and ICT. She's a professor at the Indian Institute of Public Administration in India. She serves as an advisor to 10 ministries and departments, playing a pivotal role in shaping India's governance vision for 2047 through the strategic application of digital technologies and citizen-centric approach. As a recognized academic contributor, Prof. Malorta's expertise has been shared with entities such as the Economist Intelligent Unit and the Oxford University, focusing on addressing emerging technical challenges. This expertise is backed by an extensive publication record featuring over 93 papers published in renowned international and national journals and books. Uh, Prof, uh, over to you. We can see your slides. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. I'd like you to put your uh, video on, please. I cannot start my video because the host has stopped it. So may I request you to switch on my video also for some eye contact? 100% auto. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank Prof. you. You are Sorry. wonderful. Yes. Over to so you. First and foremost, thanks everybody for inviting me, particularly the hosts. And my particular thanks to Ms. Piali Mandal for choosing me to talk about the most complicated aspect, uh, which is how to govern AI spaces. We heard all the speakers and we understood that AI is a technology that is here to stay, which will help us in many ways. So as an AI researcher, my first AI program was way back in 1984 which I wrote uh, on Holgrith cards. Uh, it was depth first algorithm during my professional qualification of master's in computer applications. So ever since then, the subject has really interested me. And uh, in uh, 2008, I talked about AI and ethics, which won the best paper award at ITU at Argentina, and where I talked about how biasness can be overcome if we use emotional quotient and spiritual quotient along with intellectual quotient while designing programs. So the topic, as I said, in uh, this context, which I'm covering is how to regulate AI spaces, because one thing for sure, the world is getting very interconnected. We have, uh, like all the speakers before me said, we have use of AI, not just in communications, but in governance, in our commercial existence, in everything to do with even uh, development aspects. So keeping that in mind, because I come from government spaces of India, where I'm trying to propose AI models for government. So for this particular event, I have broadly presented how AI can be used as an agile agent of public service delivery. PSD is for public service delivery. Now in public service delivery, I have focused on the central aim of AI to be used to provide right information to right people at the right time. And I heard my previous speaker, 
he was very carefully saying that we should fragment the kinds of audience we have so that is how i also come from the same conceptual block which says block in bloc so which says that uh, different people need different kind of information that our ai agents should be able to give according to their needs so personalized and contextualized delivery of information is possible through ai in various applications including doorstep delivery of services where india is working a lot in medical for personalized medicines for remote surgeries for basically lab experiments now with cop uh, you know mandates we also know the need of having clean green and safe spaces so ai can help us a lot in that and last but not the least like my previous speaker talked about cyber security threats all these technologies come with their own openness or flexibility of flow of data from one device to another so like i often say data because of ai is has become a global river which can start from any point and can go to any other point without the user being aware of it because there are so many cloud servers across the country and the world that you don't know which part of uh, your data is coming from which part of country so because of that the security and safety concerns of data are very relevant particularly when we talk about national security in brics particularly we are very aware that uh, any application in brics would be largely controlled by geopolitical context of other countries so keeping that in mind we have to be very careful about use of technology even in kinetic and non kinetic warfare particularly through ai so why we are talking about so many advantages and so many caution let us not forget that while evolving regulatory spaces for ai in our own countries we cannot ignore the local context of that country so i have been very fortunate to go to 600 villages of my country to understand my country very well and this was for academic study so uh, i i mean this is just a representation of my country the diverse context it brings to the table and i know through my global experience that brics country seems uh, share similar global south uh, diversity so when we have to govern ai in a country which is so diverse or in or in an ecosystem which is so different from each other how do we regulate ai making sure that innovation is aligned that means public safety public interest public data is safeguarded and yet innovation and startups in such countries thrive so that they can combat the global hegemony of other countries so keeping that in mind i always believe we should not lose focus of sustainable development goals while we are working on technology applications or technology legislations so these 17 goals are very important if we do not respond to these goals or to achieve these goals through technology we would not be able to satisfy the local context or brics context in our case so keeping this in mind with this background that we have plethora of applications i repeat we have different contexts in our countries and we have different geopolitical compulsions as well as the flexible nature of data that the governance becomes a very important criteria for us taking a pause here i would just sum up this discussion through this problem uh, this uh, particular slide which would tell my dear audience that ai will not meet all the lofty goals which i which we wanted to meet in case our countries our respective countries have technology issues have ecosystem issues 
or have organizational issues within the organization because every ministry every department every company in a country has its own context that needs to be overcome technology barriers in terms of availability of technology within the country has to be looked into as well as the total environment if i can say the total ecosystem has to be very throbbing and very healthy for ai to be adopted to overcome these barriers we need very strong ai governance models in our country okay so absence of ai governance models is like the tree not getting its nutrients its soil healthy soil water etc and the tree of ai adoption will die so this topic which i'm going to cover thanks to ms priyali and the host would make it very clear to us that we need to have strong legal and regulatory frameworks in our country these frameworks will help us to overcome several dilemmas of ai okay i have called them as pest dilemma pest means all the political dilemmas in our country all the economic dilemmas in our country all the contextual social dilemmas in our country and technical dilemmas of our country so just i mean it is very clear from the slide but just i'll go through each of them in a very you know in a very rapid manner so with regard to political dilemma so in case there is rapid proliferation of ai in a country or in, in any of the brics country the data which is freely available available because of this could be used by organizations or by uh, governments for surveillance so i call it as weaponization of ai so till i don't have great ai governance framework in our country data could be misutilized by people in power secondly citizen might lose trust on these technologies if they know or if they feel that their data or their information is not safeguarded so privacy concerns are directly related to ai okay and these are concerns emanating from individuals of the country as i said the state itself could become a big brother watching you all the time as we know 1984 george orwell so orwellian state is a surveillance state we don't want that of course i agree being in government that state should have some autonomy to defend its national security but not surveillance in day to day existence so apart from that uh, i mean i know and my first speaker our first speaker talked about various kinds of ai so we know that AGI artificial general intelligence and ASI artificial super intelligence could eventually surpass human intelligence well it might be fiction as of now but it is not improbable to visualize it so in case robots start driving us like wally -E, if somebody would have seen that or frankenstein kind of a monster so those situations should also be averted and hence i need to inculcate a very robust governance framework right from now in our countries so also i feel that political issues would get aggravated if the champions in the country are not adequately trained to handle it so that was political uh, set of problems in case ai governance is not strong economic is everything to do with money so we have to invest a lot in compute infrastructure we have to invest a lot in uh, in connectivity we have to invest a lot in data centers or cloud to keep those massive heterogeneous big data elements and last but not the least we have to also encourage the local entrepreneurs to come up with local solutions to local problems so sustain funding lot of positive environment for the companies to bloom up 
is very important and that can come only when the vision of the country at the top is very clear through its AI regulatory frameworks. Social issues can be several. Social issues, if there is no proper governance in a country, as parents or grandparents now, we have already seen how our kids have an extended arm in their mobiles, how kids have totally disconnected from the social protocols that we grew up with, which made us happier individuals than others. So apart from that, there are many other concerns, medical concerns, which need to be controlled. There are many concerns in terms of uh, empathy through uh, human beings to machines. If anybody would have seen this movie called as She, which is actually about uh, artificial super intelligence where a person falls in love with a robo and is willing to marry nobody else. So I don't want my grandson to get a robo and say like, look, uh, grandma, I'm marrying her or him. So that kind of situation is not tough, especially if we give a free flowing access to technology uh, without parental controls or in terms of proper uh, governance structures. Yes, I also worry about technical concerns about our over-dependence on certain countries for compute infrastructure, for fabrication units, uh, for also connectivity or uh, hardware. Uh, you know, we, we kind of, we do need collaboration and uh, a cohesive approach across the countries. But I also worry about geopolitical situations controlling these technical exchanges. So how do we look into that? And last but not the least, as a professor, I'm very worried about a situation where we might need burial grounds for obsolete AI devices. You know, maybe a cremation ground for robots who are no long, longer useful for us, a cremation ground for all the Kindles and laptops who are, uh, you know, who kind of bulking up at our house and are creating different kinds of uh, technical e-waste. So these concerns need to be looked into by a country holistically. So keeping in mind these concerns, we can go on and on. Each of these concerns require a very strong AI governance framework. I would say all countries need to have an AI Act. These AI Acts of the countries should be very agile, should be very, uh, when I say agile, they should be recursively updated, keeping pace with the technology trends. They should be created much before the disaster is even envisaged. They should be co-created with all the stakeholders. There are many stakeholders in AI governance framework. You have cross country, you have your own country, you have corporates, the companies, you have communities in your country which need to be a part like Ms. Mandal talked about AI, uh, talked about uh, India having uh, a very collaborative approach to its legal and regulatory framework. So co-creation involves all the stakeholders and we as individual countries should make sure that our governments are taking accord of all the voices and whispers of various stakeholders, including other countries, I repeat, including corporate bodies which are from other countries or my own startups. In terms of communities of our country, you know, we can't respond to the needs and aspirations of each and every citizen, but we can look at well-being of communities as a whole. And last but not the least, to make sure that organizations flourish within our country to ensure rapid AI adoption in every country. So to do that, we have to do away with proprietary controls. We have to dilute monopolies so that data is not stolen. There are no back doors so that data doesn't flow without consent, etc. So we have to create a very healthy competition as well as a legal and regulatory framework. 
with insistence on contextualizing these applications, with insistence, like my previous uh, speaker said, insistence on ethics and safety and responsibility. Only when this comes, uh, we would have a strong, robust AI framework in the country. So AI framework, particularly for BRICS, is all about how technology is to be adopted, how it is to be regulated, and how BRIC countries particularly can co-collaborate with each other to make responsible, safe, and ethical usage of AI. I have a long paper and study where all the regulatory frameworks in the world have been put together. I will not bore my audience with that, but two countries that need to be looked into for their AI governance is definitely your country, which is South Africa, and my country, which is India. Rest of the presentation, I'll share with my host, where all other countries have also been given in the same presentation. Okay, particularly in India, the key takeaways of AI governance have been that we have institutionalized the entire AI ecosystem by creating subgroups at the union level, at the central level. So we have seven subgroups under our Ministry of Electronics and IT, which are looking into building up center of excellence, C-O-E means center of excellence, which is looking into creating a national India data set platform that means all the non-personal data or the anonymized data of my country would be populated in a central platform so that the startups could use this data and other organizations could freely utilize this data with definitely some kind of legislative norms. Apart from that, our country is very clear that we would have a national data management office. So a regulatory body which will ensure management of this data. Dear friends, by now, with so many other eminent speakers speaking, you already know that AI is a data guzzler. Okay, It cannot thrive and bloom in case it's not rapidly using the data which is at its uh, you know, disposal. So we need to have an office, a regulatory setup to manage this data. AI and other emerging technologies, critical and emerging technologies are already evolving so fast. I always say in my different sessions that the future is already present in terms of emerging technologies. So India is focusing on future designs through its portal, India AI, please visit it. We are also focusing on skill. We are focusing a lot on the compute abilities of our labs and of fabric setting up fabrication units, which is India AI chipsets. So there are seven subgroups in our country which are trying to look into various initiatives, which I just mentioned. The whole effort is to make sure that these resources are democratized for innovation in the country. That means my local startups are able to have easier access to high power computing, easier access to data sets, easier access to skill sets and so on. So R&D is the core driving force of our country. And all this is being done not to marginalize the people on the outliers, but to bring them together. If you would have heard our Honorable Prime Minister in his various, uh, you know, addresses to the world and nation, we constantly talk about inclusive development. We constantly talk about AI for social good. So we are focusing through our R&D setups and our platformization approaches on governance issues, which I showed you 17 SDGs. We are focusing on agriculture. We're focusing on healthcare. And I can just share with you off the session, if somebody is keen, I've written papers on how AI in agriculture is making is, is being catalyzed in our country, how the national health stack of our country is doing such a great job and so on and so forth. India believes a lot in taking world along with it. So international collaborations are our key takeaway and our global leadership 
is seen through G20 presidency and GPA presidency. This is just a brief of what India is. Dear audience can see that later. But what I would want to bring to their notice is that India is already rated number one in its AI skills and India is already number five in global Stanford AI index for its newly added AI setups and, uh, you know, startups. With regard to South Africa, I'll just close here. South Africa and India share same AI governance vision. Uh, it's South Africa wants to have responsible and inclusive development of AI. They are also focusing on agriculture and healthcare, as well as on basically uh, digital economy, if I can say. They are investing in skill like India is doing. They are focusing on ethical AI use and they are also entering into international discussions to align themselves to global standards. This event is a particular proof of that. So this is my summary of what I read about South Africa AI. You could see this later. I would just close this by saying that the whole idea of AI governance regulation in BRICS country is not to stop technology or to put roadblocks or headwinds, but to ensure that technology is useful for all. So technology is useful for all will be ensured by our startups. So we need to inculcate better AI safeguards right from the beginning in all our entrepreneurial any initiatives. We also need to make sure that there is transparency in our AI initiatives at not just country level, but organization level. We should be able to moderate the differences between AI-generated output and a non-AI output. We should try to explore the power of collective, which is cross-country, country, companies, and community. So thank you all for listening to me so patiently because this was definitely a very tough topic, but I'm so glad I was given a chance. Thanks a lot. And questions are welcome. Thank you very much, Prof. Malotra. Uh, we can feel the passion and the joy that you have for the topic. And thank you also for teaching us a little bit more about governance, as well as the exposure to what the BRICS countries are doing, uh, including South Africa. So please just check the QA box. There's a number of questions already popping up. And uh, thank you very much for also helping us manage the time. Um, a number of the questions in the chat box and on the QA platform is dealing with the South African perspective and what the South African rules and regulations say vis-a-vis -vis artificial intelligence and how uh, the Department of Communication and Digital Technologies are operating and allowing government officials to operate. So I'd really like to call closer uh, Mr. Ali Mashishi, He's the Chief Director for Information Society Modeling and Forecasting at the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies. He's been serving in government for more than 20 years, working across sectors such as the Defense Force, Parliament, Presidency, and the ICT industry. Mr. Mashishi, please also pick up some of the responses to the questions. Uh, more particularly around how uh, the officials in communication are required to engage with the topic on artificial intelligence. Many thanks, sir. Uh, over to you. You have to unmute. Mr. Machish, you need to unmute. We can't hear you yet. Uh, not yet.
a mathematician, can you hear, Sally? Okay, while he's busy sorting out the technologies, let me just go to the questions. So what mechanisms can be put in place to establish cross-border data governance frameworks among BRICS nations, facilitating responsible data sharing uh, for AI research and development? Um, ECDP, how, how do we work with the department as local, local innovation, FMME, with a developed AI algorithms uh, for service delivery communication? And then how best can we leverage the use of autonomous agents for government communication? And uh, a colleague saying thank you for, um, for the responses to the questions. Uh, Mr. Mashishi, are you able to? Oh, I think he is logged out at the moment. Um, let's just see if we can uh, invite maybe a response to one of the questions. Um, Justin, are you there? Uh, uh, there was a number of questions dealing with uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and um, dealing with um, the challenges that people have vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rules of government. Maybe you just want to pick up one or two while we wait for Mr. Ali to come back in again. I see him <clears> there. <throat> Anything, Justin, on your side? Specifically to the role of government in, uh, in in what context? I'm sorry. Yes, so we government communicators have to uh, respond uh, um, using AI or um, having to deal with the challenges of AI. And so these are a number of the questions that you have answered already that you might want to just highlight. One of it is the issue of misinformation and disinformation and journalistic sure. <clears throat> Yeah, so in terms of misinformation, what I've become hyper-focused on lately is AI-generated misinformation and its capacity to automate the spread of that information at scales and speeds that, that human-centered traditional approaches may not be able to compete with. Um, so for example, uh, I come from a field of public health. We traditionally trust um, champions and professionals, uh, doctors and folks that, are, that have been traditionally viewed as sources of credible information. Uh, but as we saw over the past few years that, that um, the general public and others may be less inclined to listen to credible messengers these days and they have trouble sifting through the misinformation that has, seems, seems to be successfully spreading across the internet at rates that humans can't compete with. So um, my position on it is that government should consider AI as um, not just a um, an adversary in misinformation, but also as an ally um, to generate um, messages at a scale that can compete with AI shared misinformation. Um, so this involves developing technologies, using platforms, um, becoming comfortable with um, AI personalizing um, credible messages to hundreds of different versions of it to, for different audiences and segmentations. Um, but with this, it comes um, with a very big concern about government using AI to censor uh, emerging information that it may not want to get out or may not um, want to have amplified. Um, and so surveillance and censorship um, of information in general is a concern. So um, using AI to combat misinformation um, opens up doors that we have to consider from ethics. So, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your response, Justin. Uh, Mr. Mashishi, are you able to give us yeah. sound? Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Over to you. There are a number of questions linked to DCDT, uh, Digital Technologies Department of Communication. And more importantly, colleagues that are concerned about using artificial intelligence and exposing government systems to um, other issues like cyber attacks and so forth. Over to you, sir. Um, thank you very much. Um, you can, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you. 
Uh, my apologies. Uh, I'm in the cold Geneva, uh, attending the ITU session council. Um, and I just had to find a, a spot to be able to join this exciting conversation. Uh, we're currently actually talking about inter uh, telecommunication regulations with regards to what we're talking about currently. So it's uh, very interesting that I had to listen to some of the sessions that you have now there. And I've also seen some of the colleagues that I'm familiar with, uh, particularly from the BRIC side and uh, some of the uh, private sector colleagues. I just need to indicate this, that uh, from the South African perspective is that uh, AI for us is one of the key technological developments that uh, we consider to be the general purpose technology. Uh, it's a technology that can be able to assist us in many ways in terms of what we are pursuing and what we want to see as an outcome for the growth of our country. We see it uh, from the three perspectives. One is about there's politics around the AI. So we look at it from the politics that surrounds AI in terms of its uh, ethical usage, uh, human development. And then there's an economics of AI and that relates to productivity impact, job losses, and uh, enhancement. And then there's what we call a weaponization of AI, or what you can call militarization of AI. And from those perspectives, when we develop a policy or a plan or any form, we will then have to see how it addresses that. But from, from our side, AI for us, it's systems. It's um, AI systems that have become so embedded in everyday life. And I heard some uh, of the speakers talking about 80% of the people in the world are using AI. I think surely in a developed world, yes. Um, but I think in the developing world, those numbers might be not be as true as that. So with that, it raises a number of questions, obviously, that needs to be addressed. And these questions are, regulatory issues, ethical issues, and the impact on human, uh, whether it's human rights or human development. And also the professors have been talk, speaking there about the aspect that AI is not a new phenomenon. It's just now it's on a third um, phase where it's now dealing with the aspect that we have always thought is exclusive to humanity, which is the brain. Uh, AI has been physical, and AI has been biological before, but now it's now entering into the terrain. So there, there are different countries' uh, approaches with regards to AI, because they have to look at um, not just only their aspirations, but uh, the systems that they have, the, the connectivity capacity, uh, the issues around uh, the data. But from our side is that we see AI serving four purposes for us as a government. Firstly, it will be able to pro provide us with predictability. It will be able to provide us with automated, automated services. It will be able to provide us with uh, analytical aspects in terms of what we want to do. And fourthly, it will be able to provide us with the diagnostic abilities, whether it's climate, whether it's food production. So. We are lucky because we have been able to see the fourth industrial revolution earlier on, and we created a fourth industrial revolution report, which then looked at AI as one of the key technology. And we are implementing that. Uh, we have established the AI Institute, um, which then is sector orientated. It looks at the applied AI. There's two distinctions between AI. There's what is called applied AI, and a generative AI. The PC4IR commission report is mainly more on the applied AI in terms of the role of the state. But generative AI is also very critical because it impacts sectors like the communication sector, the education sector, the arts, and the media. We now have formulated two institutions. The Center for Artificial Intelligence Research, which falls under the Department of Science and Innovation, and looks at the research aspects around AI. And we have an artificial intelligence institute which look, looks at the applied AI side in terms of 
the solutions on the value chains and enhancing our sectors. We have now uh, going to put a national AI plan. It's in a draft format. It's going to be tabled to parliament, uh, to cabinet, sorry, and so that it can be able to release it uh, for public comment um, because we understand that AI is got a impact in all the sectors of society. In that plan, we are outlining the issues around the governance structure uh, in terms of where, um, how everything links. Because in that, we are believing that there are three aspects that uh, are linked when you're looking at AI. The issue about the national uh, management of the data, the issue around IoT, Internet of Things, particularly provision of government services, and then the AI itself. So what the plan is then having the aspect around it is that we're gonna look at what we call areas of focus. Uh, the first area of focus is around AI human capacity development, the capital development, and that impacts uh, government employees as well and the society as, as such, because it looks about the language in AI, the coding, the algorithm, the creation of critical thinking, because the application of AI requires that one has to critically think about what AI must do for them. And secondly, is the issue around AI localized solutions. Um, we want we don't want to fall into the trap to use solutions that are not uh, geared to uh, address our problems. So that is uh, another matter. And then there's an issue around reinforcing the collaboration between our academia and our industry in relation to investments and in, in relation to products that are conducive for our society. And we're gonna look at also capacitating the institutions that are already established and also to make sure that the data architecture systems is designed and is able to be able to provide uh, the use of AI. And uh, the regulation part is that we are looking at it from which parts are to be soft regulated and which ones are to be hard regulated. Uh, we know that in the United Nations, they're looking from the human rights perspective. In the UNESCO, they say ethics. And then in the ITU, they say the goodness of it. So from our country, we say, uh, we're looking at it, reigniting it so that it becomes um, a, a user tool because we are a very useful nation. And we know that, I think the professor talked about skills that we need to get the young people. In South Africa, we already have them. We just need to harness them and make it fully so. And we're also gonna look at the policy part about it. And we're gonna check on something which is important, the uh, AI maturity, uh, maturity uh, framework, assessment framework, which then tells us where are we, where are we going, and whether we are on the right path. And we're gonna set up a AI expert advisory council, which is going to advise the Minister of Digital Communication so that they can be, uh, the minister can be able to make proper decisions and advises uh, cabinet in other sectors that are important. And then lastly, because we believe that the Africa free trade, it's a critical component, is then how do we, from South Africa perspective, create centers, regional centers of excellence, where we can use AI so that we can be able to make sure that the continent itself becomes great. On the last point, uh, when it comes to the issue about service delivery, the PC4IR outlines uh, the key component that when you use AI, you should be able to use it for service delivery aspects. And on the issues around people already using generative AI in terms of the chat GTPs uh, or from the open AI, I think it's highly encouraged from our side. But what needs to be understood is that there's a issue around the divide that can come out of that because these applications like ChatGTP and OpenAI are not coming cheap. If you have a free version, it's actually not even giving you the capacity you require. You might even churning out something that you don't need. But as you go into ChatGTP 4 or 5, then you start finding a premium. That is something that we have to look at because some people will be left behind. And we are gearing ourselves to make sure that the infrastructure that we are building uh, in terms of the, at least the minimum requirement that the 5G must be expanded so that our people can be able to experience AI and be able to use it as a tool 
that will uh, advance their lives and as well as make government to provide services that are conducive and make sure that the devices that are required to drive AI are easily accessible. From that point, I wanted to um, just explain where we are from the country and where we are going. Thank you, um, Chair. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mashisha, and thank you very much for finding a little corner where you could participate in our, our webinar at uh, the National School of Government. We really want to appreciate our uh, guest speakers and as well, Mr. Mashishi, for giving us the South African uh, view on um, artificial intelligence and the systems that we require or in the process of putting up, uh, putting in place. One of the key concerns I'm listening to uh, uh, through the questions that are coming from the participants is the concern and the risk of data leaking through the um, artificial uh, back-end processes. Maybe you can just say a word about the security of information, uh, Mr. Mashishi. Uh, one of the questions was, we're not allowed to use Otter AI in government uh, because that, that uh, backs our information onto somebody else's platforms. Maybe you can just say something about the security vis-a-vis -vis our system. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. If you can still hear me. Yes, perfectly. You're there. Thank you. Uh, I was at the World Economic Forum um, the past week, and there was discussion around uh, how AI is a game changer in relation to climate, in terms of security, and also in terms of uh, the jobs of the future. One interesting thing that happened there is that AI was used effectively so to create a false image that uh, the CEO of the World Economic Forum was um, insulted and there was a commotion that was created. But um, certainly so, it was AI generated. So it becomes much more difficult um, in terms of images and in terms of videos um, that you can be able to distinguish whether uh, this is generated from the AI side or is it generated by a person. But what is key here is that we must remember that this technology is created by humans. And then the nature of humans in themselves is that they usually have a tendency of wanting to have an upper hand in everything that they do. So what we need to be very careful about is that these tools that are being generated, they are also very conducive for humanity in terms of personal life. But what we need to understand is that government is an aggregator and government is a balancer of equation. So when we have to adopt certain applications uh, for use, we need to ensure that they are conducive and to be used by everyone. We might have different classes of people in our society that can be able to afford to have um, applications that are premium, but there is open, um, open access applications which needs to be guided. So from our department, we've got three tools that we've put out which will come into effect. There is a data and cloud policy which outlines exactly how the data can be used and how the apl applications that come into our shores can be able to be used. Secondly, we have a digital economy master plan. In that, it talks about what is called um, uh, technologies that are in themselves game changers. And it outlines that uh, the AI is one of those tools and we put out uh, what to be done. And then lastly, we are dealing with the AI national plan, which is going to be able to talk about what to be regulated, what are the ethical foundations, and what are the applications that are gonna be approved locally to be used and how the industry can be worked with us in terms of ensuring that um, they secure by design infrastructure and the issue around the cyber protection of our country is clear. So that's, that's where we are. Uh, I hope I've been able to outline certain things there. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mashishi. Um, I'm also going to uh, call Mr. Namonde Mnukwa, your DG closer, uh, and then she will give us a, a different level input. 
Uh, let me introduce you to our um, our uh, acting DG, Ms. Um, Nomande Mnuka. Uh, she's currently the Deputy Director General Corporate Services at the Government Communication Information Services and acting as the GCIS Director General and Government Spokesperson. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Mnuka, please, can I ask you to put on your camera? and then give us your remarks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much and greetings to um, you, Program Director and the panelists. The, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly, thank you. Thank you so much. Greetings to you, Program Director, the panelists and um, all the attendees. Um, I think for mine, um, part is very short because there's a lot that has already been said and in avoiding just to repeat everything that has been said or most of the things that have been said, I'll just say um, uh, to everyone, um, the artificial intelligence is here to stay. The question is particularly to us as South Africans and as communicators, how do we adapt? And I wouldn't um, drag our reputation to say, um, we always are left behind, particularly on the things that have got technology and uh, um, in the use, in fact, as a nation, whilst we are, we are very good in producing the policies and the plans. But generally to just challenge um, the communicators at large to say, let us quickly derive benefits that are coming with the artificial intelligence and utilize all those tools, particularly um, the ones that I would highlight is how we can best um, achieve efficiencies through the data analytics and insights um, whereby we can um, be able to optimize um, the limited resources that we have and ensure that um, we, we, we apply the artificial intelligence so that um, we derive valuable, valuable insights in terms of decision making and we are able to make um, effective, informed policy decisions and uh, be able to identify the trends as well and patterns that will enable us to communicate effectively and ensure that um, delivery of services um, adds value. In fact, we add value to the delivery of, of, of services. Also in terms of how best uh, we can ensure that we, we utilize the chat box and virtual assistance to those areas of communication that are um, common and generic in nature. And we are able to um, uh, implement the tools that will assist us uh, to be able to have more, should I say, um, 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 interaction with the, with the citizens that we are intending to communicate with, particularly, um, as I've said, that on common themes, basically we have issues um, or we have themes in our nation that we know that definitely we have to communicate about. I just want to mention the SONA that is coming through, um, uh, the education around what is SONA, why people should um, watch, or should I say in general, all those frequently asked questions that we be able to deploy those chat box and virtual assistants. And um, particularly because there are things that we know that one way or other, we will have to deal with them. And, and if I can share an example around the service delivery issues, whereby we are able to utilize the artificial intelligence to come up with predictive um, analytics, analytics that will be able to en en enable us to be proactive in our communication but also in general to deal with um, solutions um, in, in, in major challenges that we might have. And um, the other challenge that we have, particularly around the fact that we are a country that is very diverse in terms of languages. We have about um, 11 languages um, and together now with the um, assigned language, we have 12. And how best can we utilize artificial um, intelligence given the limited resources that we have, particularly financially, to ensure that we have translation in all other languages? I think that's where we fall short in terms of our communication. Uh, we still communicate mostly in English and touching on the other languages. 
And therefore, we can then derive benefits in terms of um, artificial intelligence as well. The accessibility, I mean, we, we're a nation that um, is so proactive in accommodation, accommodative everyone and ensuring inclusivity. And basically, we can be able um, to utilize um, the translation of speech to text so for, for those um, um, part of our communities that maybe have hearing disabilities. And all I'm saying is, um, whilst it might seem that um, it is a threat, which I think I appreciate and welcome the fact that it has been really unpacked and our fears have been laid off to say, it is not here to um, replace us as communicators or in every aspect of us as public servants, but it is here to enhance the work that we do. And, and basically then saying, um, because it is here to stay, how do we best ensure that we optimize um, the utilization so that we can derive more benefits? We are a country that has got 60 plus million um, uh, people that we have to communicate to. And unfortunately, who have uh, various needs and who are at different levels in terms of the information that they require or they want from government. And therefore it can assist us to, to have a higher reach and be able to not leave anyone behind in terms of the people that we have to communicate with. I think the challenge that I initially had, which now has been resolved, is much more around the governance and um, uh, particularly also the regulations as well, given the fact that we've already seen, I think um, uh, my colleague uh, Mashini has, um, Mashishi has already mentioned just a few examples whereby there have been fake videos and fake images as well in terms of how best we can deal with that so that um, as we get into this and move forward and, and up our pace so that we're not left behind, how best we can ensure that there's credibility in terms of what we are communicating. And also um, just to deal with the threat and the risk of whereby people would come in and create um, things that might really cause the nation to be um, a, in a panic stage. And, and, and I think recently we have seen few videos whereby we later on learn that there are fake and um, I think then in, 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 in the fact that I was a bit concerned around the regulation and governance, um, the information that we've got from the colleague from the uh, Department of Digital Technologies and Communication is really comforting. There's a lot that already exists, has been approved by government that we just have to tap into. Um, and the, nation, and the AI, national, AI national plan that is about to be released. And um, the, the real challenge, uh, colleagues, is much more around how do we make sure that uh, we move with the times and how do we make it a point that, um, because remember, I think in our levels in government, we are the first ones to be exposed in artificial intelligence. The reason why I'm saying we are the first one is that we could also communicate externally, not within ourselves as well. Whilst the other colleagues, for example, in your finance um, area, you'd find out that more of their communication or more of their uh, implementation is internal. How do we make it a point that we deal with all the associated risk, we come up with a risk mitigation plan, and we come up with solutions in terms of how we're going to be able to uh, deal with the threats that are at stake? I think recently we had a situation whereby um, even the, the presidential speech that was delivered, I think it was last month, if I'm not mistaken, we had a number of people questioning if it was not generated through artificial intelligence. So for us colleagues, it's just being proactive and getting into spaces that maybe no one has already got into and being able to come up with some plans. I'm not thinking that they would be um, plans that would be taught watertight to such a point that uh, Mr. Mashishi uh, indicated that these systems are developed by us as human beings, and therefore we have a way also of having to utilize them um, to the disadvantage of what we have utilized them for. But having a, a risk a mitigation plan and implementing it will assist us, but also cross-pollinating and uh, sharing some lessons and what is it that we are learning as, as, as a collective. 
I think um, a program director, just in, in closing, I would then say I really appreciate all the inputs for, from all the panel members. We've taken them. And I think the issue of ethics that I was talking about uh, to just in, 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 in even elaborated on it. And Professor Siddhartha as well um, uh, challenged us to say um, we need to get um, the younger generation to get into the space because they less fear, you know, um, uh, exploring. And therefore, we also have to be there for them in terms of ensuring that uh, we mentor them in the process whilst they come up with a skill that we might not have all of us, but mentoring becomes very uh, critical in, in order to ensure that we limit the risk that we might um, uh, have. And um, colleagues, I think just in a nutshell is something that then says um, uh, uh, to us, we have a, um, a challenge and let's derive all the opportunities that exist through this and uh, optimize and utilize them to our best advantage. Thank you, Program Director. Thank you very much, Acting DJ, uh, Ms. Manuka. Thank you very much for the, the lovely summary that you've given us and also tying it between government communication as well as uh, digital technologies. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the end of our webinar uh, session. I'm going to ask my DDG Pandile Mkwanazi just to step closer and to make closing remarks and to bring us to the end. It was wonderful to be with you. Over to you, Ms. Mkwanazi, to take us on. Uh, thank you, Louise, and thank you for being such a good program director. Um, I'd like to thank all our panelists for joining us today. And we know we've learned quite a lot from them. I'm not going to repeat the acting DG has already covered the, the lessons learned and how it's, it's going to, how are we responding to that as the NSG? I would like to also highlighting our panelists, um, Professor uh, Dubé, for really waking up very early because he's, he's in New York and the time he, he had to wake up before 4 a.m. to join us for this webinar. So we appreciate your, your sacrifice and having to share your knowledge with us and appreciate all the colleagues. And also um, just to mention the people that are in the background of organizing this, Colin, we appreciate you bringing this so that um, public servants can actually benefit from the knowledge of uh, the experts out there in the world. Uh, we've learned quite a lot from all of them. I want to highlight for all the government communicators that are on this platform, that there is a, a, a course that's coming up, uh, Mastering Government Communication, it will be in March. Can you please contact the National School of Government Contact Center to get more information and confirm your attendance. This course was designed with GCIS looking at what communicators are supposed to be doing. And what we've done today is adding in the kind of work um, the communicators are supposed to do. So we look forward to seeing you and hosting you in that program. Uh, there was a question around the recording, if it will be made available. We want to highlight that this is actually live on YouTube. So anyone who wants to go back and look at it can go to the NSG uh, YouTube page and they will find the recording and they can be able to get the information there. I uh, would like to thank everyone, all the participants as well for joining and asking the questions. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Uh, we'll close the day now and say thank you so much for attending this masterclass with the NSG. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.